Good morning and good July to you. I have three books to talk about today and a bunch of audiobooks. So the first one is Stoicism, a very short introduction. This is not an announcement, but I guess it is an announcement in that like you don't know it and I'm about to tell you. I'm starting a podcast about Stoicism with my friend Anna um, and you'll hear more about that in like September, I'm not going to tease you anymore. But basically, uh, we're both really into, not well, not really into, but we're into like popular stoicism. Um, and I wanted just like a bit more historical context. So stoicism is a school of thought, ancient school of philosophy, that has three original writers whose work has made it into the present. Uh, that's Seneca, Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus. And they're all just extremely readable and relatable because um, they mostly are dealing with ethics. Um, uh, but the thing is, they actually were around four or five hundred years after the start of Stoicism, after the initiation of the school, so they don't really represent the views of the school of Stoicism. Um, all that and more I learned in this. Uh, I don't think I've ever highlighted a book more than I have highlighted this. It took me so long, it's so short, but it took me so long because I was just kind of trying to get all these little nuggets of wisdom. Uh, yeah, so Stoicism, love it. I'm not going to be reviewing the, I mean I've already read a bunch, but I'm not going to be reviewing any of the like original stoic works on this channel because I don't really think that's what you're here for and also I don't need to record it on here because I'm going to record it on the podcast which you're going to have to subscribe to. The second book I have to talk about is a real departure from what we've just said which is Everything I Know About Love by Dolly Alderton. I just wanted something light and silly after my heavy podcast reading um, and this was that but I could wax lyrical about how much I dislike this book. I really, really didn't like it. And the only reason I gave it two stars and not one star is that I can't deny that she's a good writer. Like it's humorous, it's fun, it's very like well paced, but oh, everything else about it, I really, really disliked. So the gist of it is, is that Dolly Alderton is like now, I don't know, 31. Uh, she grew up around London and is a journalist. And this is just a memoir of her twenties basically. and. Her, it's not really about love at all. I mean, it is, and it's like about the love of her friends, um, but it's mostly about party dates. It's mostly about parties and dates. This woman is a terrible role model. The first three or four chapters are just about her romanticizing drinking and sex, and like it's literally just going on about how she's a teen drinker, and that was like really bad, but secretly she's like really proud of herself for being this rogue teenager. Like even throughout her mid-twenties she would go on all night benders, like her friends would all go home and then she would like go to a random pub and keep chatting to like whoever, whatever random old man was there until like 6am. She'd get taxis all the way through the country at like 4am so she could continue her bloody benders. Sorry that's a bit of fluff. Go away fluff. Um, and I don't think that's cool. Like I don't, I don't think it like repulses, I just find it really sad and she seems to think that it's just like everyone has these like interests I'm just like a bit overboard with them because I'm so much fun. Also some specific things. I also can eat. I'd heard about this upshot of a breakup before but I'd never imagined it would affect me. I was always and always have been a very hungry girl. Just those kind of like little things that you drop in that's like oh no yeah you're supposed to be always losing weight as a societal default in a way that's like, I think is really damaging to young people. This one also really bothers me. She's terrified of aging. And I'm so over people that like are scared of getting old. And I know I can say I'm just turned 26. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna like definitely feel different about that when I get older or whatever. I think I will about the, my body physically <laughs> getting worse, but I don't think I will be about just being like, oh no, I'm a, my twenties are over. And now like all of the fun is gone. So hold on. I'm just gonna. This is when she's talking to her friend about turning 30. It feels like for the last few years I've been doing tourism into what your 30s are like, almost to prepare myself. I've dipped in and out, I've sampled the experience. Like what, I ask. Like, I don't know, going to the Cotswolds for a weekend mini break. I see, I said. Or having a cleaner come once a month. Right. Or buying an iron or being in a book club. But tonight I've realised I'm not a tourist anymore. I can't go on holiday into my 30s and retreat back into the shabby hopefulness of my 20s. I'm actually just there now. Oh God, I said, the poignancy of her words weighing down on me. You can never leave. You're a resident. It's like all the irony of adulthood is gone. Precisely. When we used to grow herbs in the kitchen windowsill, people thought it was kind of kitchen cute. Whereas now, it's just you being a boring 30-something. I finished that sentence, flummoxed with epiphany. It's like, I don't know why you can't 
unironically enjoy growing herbs and going on mini weekends to the Cotswolds without it being like just a thing that you do in your the reason you do it in your 30s is that it's enjoyable like it's not like it's not also enjoyable in your 20s I just got a national trust membership I'm like full-on basically am a mid 30 something already in the way I spend my time and uh I love it like why be ashamed of that Oh, oh, I didn't like this book for the same reason I didn't like Notes on Nervous Planet by Matt Haig, is that it just assumes this default of, like, everyone's sex and drink obsessed, everyone has massive FOMO, um, and, and then is like, this is how I overcame those things, instead of being like, why do we have to have that premise? I don't understand. Anyway, uh, this, and also the thing that really bothered me about this, which I know is, is my fault, is that I'm annoyed at how many people love it. <laughs> I mean, people are like, oh my god, yeah, such inspiration, she's gonna be like the new Cat Limoran. And it's like, no, there's nothing dissenting about this at all. It's just like participating in the worst sides of youth society, and I'm like getting really over it. Well, that was a rant, wasn't it? Okay, let's go back to... Let's go back to a book I did enjoy. This is Work Like a Woman by Mary Portis. Mary Portis was just like a name that was vaguely familiar to me, um, but I didn't actually know who she was. But when I've mentioned this to them, they've been like, ah, oh, Mary, Queen of Shops. She did a bunch of TV shows in like the mid 2000s. Um, so Mary Portis is 49 years old. You hold this properly. She started out as a, she didn't go to uni. She went, she became a window dresser at Harrods and like clawed her way onto being on the Harvey Nichols board, which is a department store in London, a better department store. Um, yeah, she was on the board of Harvey Nichols before she was 30. And she's just like a complete badass businesswoman. And this is about how she throughout her career had kind of like played the game, played the man's game in the boardroom to get her way up. And then like over the last decade or so has, has realized that that's actually quite like very very toxic she has this massive insight into the, like high up in the retail industry and how it operates and she also now runs a like consultancy business called portus which has i think 60 odd employees uh, and she's the ceo there and how they are enacting changes in their policy and their culture so a lot of this is about changes you can make in the workplace to make it both a friendlier place for women a better place to take advantage of the female workforce, especially around kind of like childcare and stuff like that, but also just make it like a more empathetic, balanced place. Um, and by taking a lot of these kind of like nurturing uh, qualities of, of women and taking advantage of them in a work setting. After Dolly Alderton, I was like, yes, a woman that has authority over what she's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and I love this for it. It was like a bit of a, it's exactly what you expect it to be in that it's just like a woman talking about women and I've, I feel like I read so much of this kind of thing so the content is sort of lost on me. Um, but there was, so I did really like this until I got to one bit and then I realised I should be a bit more critical and that is when she's, um, she's outlining the mission of Portas. Uh, you know, we do the best work, I focus on progress, not activity, everyone has a voice and to play a part, we're sharers, not hardness, whatever. Um, and the last, well, the second last one is, we do not distinguish between work and play, and it says in it, our work is our calling rather than our job. And that is something I really disagree with in a workplace, I think there should be massive separation between your work life and your play life, um, because otherwise it's, it, because without that, you end up doing normalising stuff like late nights and terrible working conditions because it's so much a part of your... I think everyone should... Work should be the secondary thing in their life. Um, and like, it's fine, I can have different opinions to, <laughs> to Mary Portis. Um, but it was more like I was... I think was really championing her as the perfect CEO. And then I got to that bit and I was like, wow, this book is obviously extremely subjective. It's from her view. You don't see it from like, I'm sure plenty of her employees disagree with her on a lot of things. So that was a good point to be like, maybe you shouldn't you should take everything with a little grain of salt. Other thing I thought was interesting was talking about universal childcare, um, which like as a concept, I hadn't thought of at all until a couple months ago. The idea that we would have a universal childcare system akin to the NHS but just for childcare. Um, like when I first heard of this I was like that sounds like a ridiculous expensive idea. No. But actually she talks about it a bit and how it 
pays for itself like it literally pays for itself in the like those women are back in work and then provide more money into the economy and more goes to tax and then it pays for the childcare which I'd like to read more about that actually because I think it's really powerful and it's but it's just not on a political agenda mostly because there are only men at the top and then also because like the women at the top are not like women's issues are never prioritized it's a women's issue but it's a it's a people issue she does also talk a lot about like masculinity like a, the, the fragility of masculinity is an equal size problem um and how you know you know all of that feminism shit you've heard it all before so i should have said this at the top i found out about this because she did a podcast um also called work like a woman i think there are eight episodes i'm not sure if there's gonna be a second season it's definitely just promotion for this book um so this book came out last year and that podcast came out a couple months ago and it is just phenomenal like that's how i i I listened to the podcast and I was like, I need to buy that damn book. It's, this has been very effective. She's just a very eloquent um, speaker, but also humorous and just seems like a, a really awesome woman and has a really cool team of people behind her and um, they're interesting interviews on that show. So if you're intrigued, I really recommend listening to the podcast. If you're as inspired as I was, go out and buy the book. Oh my God, I should film these more in the morning. It's like 6 a.m. and I usually film them on like a Sunday afternoon. But I feel like I can just talk. I feel like I'm just talking and it's working. I should do this in the morning more often, but maybe not like 22 hours before you go on holiday and before you have to do a full day of work and also pack. <laughs> I've also been audiobooking a lot this month. So the first thing I listened to was Wolf Hall by Hilary Mantel. This is like a monster of a book. It came out in 2009. The sequel, Bring Out the Bodies, came out in 2012 not sure um and the third one in the trilogy is going to come out next year and this is about thomas cromwell's life so the first one is his kind of ascent into the throne of into the throne <laughs> into the court of uh, of henry the eighth in the 1500s and it's really good i can tell the quality of writing was amazing but um there were a lot of time jumps and I cannot deal with audiobooks with that when you can't just kind of like slip in and know the context. Um, so from that respect, I feel like I didn't get anything out of it because I like was listening to bits and I was like, it just, I could kind of think through, oh, I think they're at this point in the story and I could hear bits and be like, oh, I know that this would be super interesting if I could remember the context. So that's all my fault. But I just really, I really enjoy listening to audiobooks while I'm coding um, and also while I'm doing like menial physical stuff. But when your mind wanders a bit, it's annoying. So I've just gone back to my old standard of re-listening to Harry Potter again and again. Um, so I started this month on the, I didn't want to go from one all the way through. So I started at three and then got to the end of seven in like a week and a half. Um, and then I decided the base i need to just have a set of audiobooks that i can re-listen to without it being like really exhaustive but you know it's familiar enough that i don't ha i can just drop in anywhere but also it's not so familiar that i ruin it for myself which is what i definitely done with harry potter because i really listen to it like every six months um so i started listening to the lord of the rings audiobooks by rupert degas i've know i've listened to them before but I can't figure out when. I feel like I haven't physically read Lord of the Rings in like eight years. Um, and at the moment I'm halfway through The Two Towers um, and they're great. I've forgotten how similar they are to the films. It feels like every line in the film was actually taken directly from the book. Um, and they're just like, so it's like coming home. <laughs> I love it so much. Uh, and it's just, it also makes me really want to watch the films because I, there's so many things that the films do better than the books and I mean is that a controversial statement anymore? No, they're phenomenal films. Like the fact that the Two Towers and Return of the King are split in half and the second half is Frodo and Sam off on their journey and the first half is everywhere else. I way prefer the everyone else um, so just like slogging it through the Frodo and Sam bits is a bit tiring but oh so good. So I have those Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings and then um, Sherlock Holmes Complete Collection by Stephen Fry on Audible, bloody fantastic. Could listen to that over and over again. And also Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which is also narrated by Stephen Fry. He's my main, he's my main man. Um, I haven't listened to that in a while. I've listened to that twice before. So I just need, I need more of stuff 
that is familiar, but I can't, like, I can't make it familiar by audiobooking it for the first time because it doesn't go in enough. Do you know what I mean? Um, although I did manage to do this with Name of the Wind, which I've now listened to twice and it feels familiar enough. Um, I don't know, if you have any recommendations for, like, big fantasy that doesn't have an American narrator, I just don't like the sound of the the kind of audiobook narrators that you get in America are, are very jarring to me. Not like all American accents, obviously I love some American accents, but um, sometimes they just, they, yeah, it, it basically needs to be Stephen Fry. <laughs> and before you ask, I have listened to all of Stephen Fry's audiobooks of his own work. He just needs to record everything. Wow, I am blathering along. Let's, um, let's go to work. I will um, catch you at the end of August. I'm going to be away for most of August, so I don't know whether that means I'll get a bunch of reading done or not a lot. Who knows? Anyway, if you have read any of the books I've talked about, let me know what you thought. If you disagree with me, that's fine. People aren't all supposed to have the same opinions, because otherwise the world would be really boring. Um, yes, talk to you in August. Goodbye.